service this week. It's been a real blessing. And uh, I appreciate Brother Carper uh, playing the organ. That's been a blessing also. And uh, I don't know when he's preached any better than what he has preached this week. And I've not put any time on him. And he's, I feel, has the liberty of the pulpit. And I've certainly enjoyed every message. And I'm looking forward to hearing him tonight. And again, to our visitors here tonight, thank you for coming and being here. We certainly appreciate you being here. I think most of you, or all of you, do we have a first-time visitor? Anyone here for the very first time? Oh, this is your first time being in Tabernacle Baptist Church? Oh, okay, just for the meeting. Well, you're supposed to give $100. You know that. <laughs> uh, I thought everybody had been here before, and it's the first time to the meeting, but we thank you for coming. And uh, I'm just going to get out of the way and have Brother Dr. Benny Carper come. I've heard, certainly enjoyed the fellowship and, and enjoyed the preaching. Thank the you. service is God yours. Bless God bless you. Bless Appreciate you. you. Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Ephesians tonight, the book of Ephesians chapter number two, and it's been a joy to have been with you all this week, and I am grateful for all of your hospitality and kindness. I will send you a bill for the uh, organ repair, and uh, I expect for that to be paid by the 32nd day of August, and um so uh, you'll be looking for the bill. It'll come to, to you. You can pay me in $3 bills, and that'll be fine, and, uh, or $7 bills, either one. And, uh, but I've, I've enjoyed being here, and I appreciate you so much for your kindness and hospitality. And uh, the room where I've stayed has been nice. I went home last night and uh, then came back over today. I needed to take care of my mail for the bright spot hour, and and get all that organized and I have to get a deposit ready because tomorrow I have to start writing uh, checks. Tomorrow will be right at the middle of the month and so I've got to start getting the radio bills paid. And uh, I need to get Zap. Uh, Zap is almost $1,000 a month. And that's $690. Uh, I'm on at $830. we have been on at $830 since Mays Jackson helped us get that time. He's responsible for us being on up there, and we've been broadcasting without a break on WZAP since 1984. And Mr. Morris has never gone up on our rate, and I'm grateful for that. It's a lot of money, but he never has gone up, and I appreciate that. But I need to start getting bills paid, and I had to, you know, you got to do one thing so you can do another. And so I have to have the mail and get the deposits ready, and then I can write checks and pay out our radio stations. Last year, I spent on postage and fuel, I spent $19,000 on postage and fuel, and that's a lot of money, but praise the Lord, it, it came in, and uh, it amazes me, they got a lady over in Asheville that supports us each month, and she'll send between one and three dollars a month. But when I couple her offering with somebody else's offering and somebody else's offering and somebody else's offering, the first thing you know, you can make up your budget. And so I appreciate that. And uh, uh, I, she gets a letter in response every month from me, and I appreciate her sending a dollar. I'm grateful for that. She sends a dollar, and I appreciate it. So I hope I'm not going to guarantee you the organ's repaired. It's working now. I plugged up a few things that were unplugged, but I didn't cut any wires or replace any parts, so it might fail, you know, next Sunday, but we'll see. If it does, I'll hold my bill. <laughs> I've enjoyed preaching this week. Now, next week, the Lord willing, I start. I preach Friday night, by the way, in Morristown, Tennessee, at Bible Airs Baptist Church, and they're having their homecoming meeting, and my part of the meeting's Friday night, and then... Uh, on Sunday, I start at, at, uh, at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church in Vallis, North Carolina, outside of Boone. Wynn Greer is the pastor. And then the week after that, I'll be at, uh, at um, uh, Andrews Memorial Baptist Church 
in Brown Summit, North Carolina, which is just outside of Greensboro. Mark Gaffney is the pastor there. And then the week after that, I will be preaching uh, right over here at Cleveland at Copper Ridge Baptist Church in Cleveland, Virginia, just outside of Lebanon. And that's the only church where I stay all week. And I'll be there Sunday morning to Friday night. And the uh, week after that, I'll, first week of April, I'll be with Jerry Honeycutt and his people in Roan Mountain, Tennessee, and then just ride on and on from place to place. So you pray the Lord will help me and, uh, and give us strength and grace to press on in the work. Now, I've been dealing with birthrights that belong to the born-again believer, and I've been working over to chapter 4 and verse number 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And this is to be executed with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now I'll have more to say about that in the course of the message. But I've been trying to develop last uh, Monday night and last night and tonight the purpose of the word therefore. Paul's appeal to the believers in Ephesus for a worthy walk is based upon what we have been studying in chapter number one and number two. It is our birthright. Now, we had our 20th class reunion more than 10 years ago, and I stood up, and all of us had the opportunity to stand up. My classmates, by the way, gave me a King James Bible, and I appreciate my classmates doing that, and I've read that Bible through eight times. I've been waiting on them to get around to having another reunion. Everybody's got to eat. We can go somewhere and eat and get, get a crowd together. But I'm going to take that Bible back and say your investment was not in vain. Look how many times I've read this one through. I know I've read that, that Bible through eight times. But I, I've, there was a picture of our class, senior class picture in our uh, graduation rows. And I said, if y'all will look at that picture, I'm not in it. And I said, I have known some of you longer than I have known anybody on earth. Because there were a handful, four or five of my classmates that I graduated with, and we started in the first grade together and went all the way through school together, 12 years of school. But I said, I was not in that picture. I said, let me tell you where I was that day. And the day that our class picture was to be made, my grandfather said, now tomorrow you're not going to school. And I didn't say back to my grandfather, well, no, we're going to have class pictures. I can't miss that. I said, yes, sir. And he said, my brother, my granddad's brother, Aubrey, my great uncle, and I are going to go to Gaston, South Carolina, and visit all the graves of your grandfathers. We're going to visit every grave of every Sattler grandfather. And there were six of those graves. And the earliest of those graves, my great-grandfather six times, George Sattler, was uh, arrived in the United States 50 years before the Declaration of Independence and was a citizen of the state of South Carolina when it was a colony. And there is an unbroken line in my family of people born in South Carolina 50 years before the Declaration of Independence. Well, I wasn't aware of that as a 17-year-old boy, but I was after I saw those graves. And I watched my grandfather and his brother. They were 15 months apart. My granddad was born. 15 months later, his brother Aubrey was born. So they grew up together and were lifelong buddies as well as Brothers, when my granddad started Tabernacle, Aubrey was right there as a charter member to support his brother in the ministry and to try to help him get that church going. And uh, that was an education, just to watch those two brothers interact with each other. But I'll never be the same after seeing those graves. And whenever I came back, my grandfather didn't say, now you have a great heritage to live up to, and, and point his finger at me and say, now you better do this. My grandfather knew I had enough sense to recognize what I was looking at. And I discovered for the first time why I am who I am and I'm named like I'm named and I live in South Carolina and I talk like I talk and sound like I sound and have the background I have. I understood that day why I am like I am. 
Well, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul has been trying to do to these Ephesian believers. He knows if they recognize who they are and what they have in the grace of God, their birthright in the grace of God, then there won't have to be a great appeal for Christian service. All the apostle will have to say is, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Or we could say, just live up to your birthright. After reading these verses, chapter 4, verse number 1, almost sounds like an anticlimax. It almost seems like an understatement of what Paul has been dealing with. Now, so far we've seen six of these birthrights. I am not going to re-preach this, but I would like to touch on them momentarily. Verse number one, uh, three of chapter one. In uh, verse number three, the latter part of the verse, believers, number one, are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We operate out from our blessing, not toward it. Secondly, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Don't let that frighten you. But in the eternal counsels of Almighty God, God had all the details of your new birth experience and mine already worked out. And when I was saved 43 years ago, I didn't catch God by surprise. God had that already worked out in his eternal counsels before Genesis 1, 1. Now, I can't explain that to you. I can't explain it. But then I can't explain to you the biology of a natural birth. I don't understand how a baby breathes in his mother's womb, but it doesn't breathe air, it breathes embryonic fluid. But it breathes fluid in his mother's womb. But when it's born, a fish breathes fluid. But when the child is born, it breathes air. Now, I'm not prepared to explain that to you, but I believe it because I can see you and that's how you got here and you can see me and that's how I got here. I don't understand how God in his infinite wisdom had all the details of our salvation worked out on the left side of Genesis 1.1. And yet, everyone that's born again has a profession of faith. That's why I'm not a fatalistic Calvinist. There, nobody on earth tonight is saved that doesn't have a profession of faith. Everybody that's saved has a point in time when you were born again. But when you were born again, God had already worked out those details out yonder and you just met the appointment. Now, if you say that you can explain that, I don't believe you. I can't explain that, but I believe it. It's a marvelous thing of the grace of God. Then verse number five, here's the third of these. Having predestinated us and born again believers do not live by luck, chance, hope, uh, uh, throwing the dice. We live by predestination. God has the details of your life worked out in advance. And every one of us can look over our shoulder and see how grace has, has brought me this far. The pastor and I were talking tonight, and I appreciate uh, his confidence, and he and I had a very plain conversation one with the other, preacher to preacher. And I look over my shoulder and things that I misunderstood 20 years ago, I now look back over the 20 years, and rather than being bitter over it, I see the providence of God. Oh, yes. Having predestinated us, and you and I live by predestination, God has the details of your life worked out 10 years from now. You don't know the thoughts you'll be having 10 years from now because you don't know what's gonna happen 10 years from now. But God already has the details worked out. And you can't conceive of them. Then again, number four, verse number seven, we have redemption right now through his blood. Now I'm, I'm waiting for the redemption of the body, but I won't be any more redeemed a thousand years from now than I am right now. And our redemption is through his blood. I'm not saved by water baptism or church membership. I'm saved by the blood of Christ. Amen. Then number five, 
In verse number 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now, every one of us are going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, none of us are going to have everything we wish we could have at the judgment seat, and we're all going to say, Boy, I wish I hadn't wasted my time on that. I wish I hadn't wasted my time on that. But none of us are going to be empty handed because all of us are born into an inheritance. And you don't earn an inheritance. You are born into an inheritance. And every one of us have that in the grace of God. We have obtained an inheritance in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that inheritance is already fixed for me now. It's predestinated right now. When I get to heaven, I'll be satisfied with my inheritance. And when you get to heaven, you'll be satisfied with yours. When your family read your mother and dad's will, that is none of my business. None of my business. But you were very satisfied with your portion. And when my dad's will was read, that's none of your business. But my brother and I were very satisfied with what we received from my dad's portion of the will. Now, my inheritance is already predestinated in heaven. And your inheritance and my inheritance may not be exactly the same thing, but I promise you, you'll be satisfied with yours and I'll be satisfied with mine. That's what my father gave me. And then number six, in verse number 12, 13 rather, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, here it is now, the sixth birthright, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Every born again believer is indwelt by the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God that gives energy and vibrance to the Christian experience. Being born again is a judicial act of having our sin put away in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But the new birth doesn't stop with just a judicial act. God gives every born again believer the indwelling Holy Spirit and he tabernacles in your body and he energizes you and comforts you and goes alongside of you and he opens your understanding. He blesses you. He guides you. He gives you illumination. There have been times in my life, and I'm certain the same is your testimony, when I have not known what to do. But I knew in time God would let me know. And it's, it's like a revelation. Now, God doesn't speak to me in an audible voice, but there have been a few times he might as well have spoken to me in an audible voice. I was so convinced of what I needed to do. That's the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit is given to seal you until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit in you will guarantee that you won't fall from grace. The Spirit of God guarantees it will make it to the redemption of the purchased possession. Now chapter number two, I have to skip Paul's prayer. We'll deal with that at some other time. Uh, chapter number two, the seventh birthright is found in verse number six. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, now I don't know how long an age is, but these ages are plural, so it's gonna be a long time. How do you like that? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now let me say this in passing. Every one of us are saved. Why did God save your soul anyway? Why did he save you? I didn't say, are you saved? Why did he save you? And people say, I've heard preachers get in a big way and preach and I'm afraid maybe I've said this before in a bit of foolishness. That, uh, bless God, if God didn't want you to go to work, bless God, he knocked you in the head and took you to heaven when he saved you. Service is not the main purpose or the only purpose in our redemption. That would be as ridiculous as me telling my wife uh, on our wedding day, all right, baby, you belong to me now. I'm going to take you to the house. I bought you a new washer and dryer and a mop and a bucket. Now get to work. 
I'd have been better off to have hired a maid. Now, you women would be offended by that if, uh, if, if I said, bless God, the only reason for these women, bless God, put them to work. Put them to work in the house. And you women would be offended, and rightly so. Rightly so. Where does love enter into that? It's an interesting thing. My wife performs all the duties of a maid, but she's not one. She's a joint heir with me in the grace of life. That's what Paul said. These women's livers and equality movement are late getting to it. Paul got to equality 2,000 years ago. By the way, in Islam, and I don't hear these women livers fussing about this, in Islam, women, a man can have four wives at a time, he can divorce a wife at any time with no grounds and she has no recourse. He just walks up to his wife and says, I divorce you. And she has no recourse. He can get rid of her and he can marry him another one. It, in fact, Islam provides for a temporary wife for an hour. If a man's traveling in a distant city, he can have a temporary wife for one hour. Everybody, everybody in here knows what that is. It's called adultery. Islam. Islam is a perfect man-made religion to satisfy the lust of men. I wonder why the women's liberation movement isn't protesting against Islam, but they're protesting against Christianity. And Paul the Apostle said that wives are joint heirs. Now, can you get any more equal than that? They're not my children. They are our children. It's not my house. It's our house and it's not my money it's our money joint heirs in the grace of life and yet they'll protest against Christians they went up a bunch of fundamentalists down there in the south they want to keep women barefoot and in the house and uneducated and ignorant that crowd, that crowd doesn't know what they're talking about I'm burned out with hearing poor little old Matt Lyre and the rest of those New York sophisticates that are ignoramuses. I know they're pretty and they can read a teleprompter well, but you take them off the teleprompter and they'll be as bad as Barack Obama. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> you know, they say taking drugs, you know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Just look in the Oval Office. <laughs> yeah I said that <laughs> don't send this to Washington now now why did God save you God saved you to magnify his glory to the praise of the glory of his grace he saved you to magnify the grace of God our service is a result of our appreciation and loving regard for the fact that we've been saved. It's a marvelous thing. And whenever you see Christianity like that, it makes service a joy rather than a drudgery. I right, to notice the context here quickly. Hath raised us up together. In verse number one, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. That's where I was. I was born dead, spiritually dead. I could honestly buy a billboard. I, I wouldn't do this. I could buy a billboard in every city where I hold revival, put my picture up there, and put in big letters Come here, this man. He was born dead. And that'd be a true statement but not like they would take it. I was born dead in trespasses and in sins. Now it gets worse. Watch this. Where in time past you walked according, there's one of those 16 accordings again, according to the course of this world. The world is on a definite course. And we're not going to change it. The moral majority is not going to change it. The, Amer the American Family Association is not going to change it. We are on a collision course with this world and we are praying to pull and pluck a few brands from the burning 
as this world on its course goes headlong to hell, we try to pull a few out. But we're not going to set up the kingdom, fellows. Jesus is going to come back and set up the kingdom. Evil men and seducers are not going to get better and better. They're going to wax worse and worse. And as you and I try to live to the glory of Christ and follow the scriptures, we are on a head-on collision course for the world. So we walked in time past according to the course of this world. Then again, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is the devil. Now watch this next clause. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This world not only has a course, it has a spirit. And there is a spirit of the world. There are people in this county that are demon possessed. They are as full of the devil as you are full of the Lord. They are filled up with the adversary of the devil. In my mind, only a demon-possessed doctor could perform an abortion. Only a demon-possessed individual could demand that babies die and murderers go free. You ask these people protesting Whenever a murderer is getting ready to be put to death. In South Carolina, we would, whenever we had somebody getting ready to go to death row, we used to electrocute them. Of course, that's not humane now, so we give them a lethal injection. But 30 years ago, in law enforcement circles, they'd uh, kid each other and say, well, they're going to dim the lights tonight in Columbia. Going to shoot a little electricity over an electric chair. Fella killed a bunch of people and slaughtered them, butchered them up. And it's come time for him to die. And there'd be people down there with placards protesting, saying that the man ought to go free. What about his victims? Amen. What about mother and dad whose daughter was raped and then beheaded? But if you ask those nincompoops with their placards walking around, idiots, social misfits, we used to put people like that in insane asylums, what's your position on abortion? Well, a woman's got a right to choose. So you think an innocent baby ought to be murdered, but a murderer ought to be set free. Oh, yes. Yes, that's his constitutional right. Only somebody whose brain is messed up can think of something like that. The world has a course, and we are on a collision course with it. And you don't have to be a religious fanatic to be on a collision course with this world you just stand up and say, I believe God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour days. And the arrows will start coming at you. Then you say, and I don't believe in man-made global warming because God fixed the laws of physics in creation. They say, man, we need to put you in a nut house. You ask any evolutionist to explain the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And evolution crumbles. Just fit the laws of thermodynamics into it. And if you can make the law, thermodynamics, we get that from that the scientific law of entropy. This is what that means. You build a house, if you don't keep it maintained, it'll rot. Entropy is things do not go from disorder to order. They go from order to disorder. That's why our cars rust out and our house, houses rot down and your silver tarnishes law of entropy. God fixed that in creation. Now, you stand against that. You know, these people talk about we, we, uh, evolution. You know, we keep going. Uh, I finished reading a book recently by Ann Coulter. Some of y'all have seen her on Fox News. She's a prolific writer. I don't, my wife and I read all the time and we don't read the same books. She write, reads books, uh, Christian romance books and stuff like that. And I, I read, you know, nonfiction, dry stuff. And I don't read books but written by women. I'm a man. I, women don't speak like men. They don't use a man's vocabulary. But I'll read Ann Coulter's book because she can write like a man. She wrote a book entitled Godless. You ought to get it. The adults ought to read it. I wouldn't let the small children read it. 
I mean, she doesn't pull any punches. She's got more guts than half the Southern Baptist preachers in Tennessee. And the thesis of her book is simply this. She starts with the theory of evolution and shows how the theory of evolution in 1850 by Charles Darwin, when it was published, produced Adolf Hitler within 100 years. And she draws that line unmistakably. The title of the book, by the way, is Godless, the Church of Liberalism. It's a worthwhile read. You ought to read it. All you have to do is stand against the course of this world. You go to college and your professor says, now we don't use the Bible as a science book and, and uh, only simple-minded people use the Bible as a science book. That was said this week in the Senate. In the U.S. Senate this week, Monday night. And these people that use the Bible and believe the Genesis account of creation, they're simpletons. And I stand up and say, I don't care what you say. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. You explain anything any better than that. Amen. And I'm on a collision course. Now listen to this contradiction. I got to go. I didn't name to get hung up here. We have the Endangered Species Act to protect endangered species. And yet all the people that defend the Endangered Species Act are in favor of evolution. Well, now, if life forms are evolving, then when they evolve to the next state, whatever they were before becomes extinct. So how can a man believe in evolution that things are going to evolve and support the Endangered Species Act, which, according to him, retards evolution? Why don't we let them go extinct so they'll evolve into a better life form? I'm not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> That's the course the world's on. And they call me a simple Simon. A simple Simon is somebody that believes in evolution over here and the Endangered Species Act over there. That's a self-contradiction. But if I say anything about it, they'll call me a religious fanatic and some of this crowd will sick of IRS on me. We are, we're going to have a head-on collision with them. Now, I don't think you ought to pick any fights. But with God's grace and help, we're not going to run from them. We're going to draw our position based on the Bible, and they can get over it. Y'all do what y'all need to do, but I'm going to stand on the King James Bible. The prince of the power of the air, the devil is behind all of this. The devil is the god of the governments of this world, by the way. Among whom, verse number three, we all had our conversation, our manner of life in times past, before we were saved in the lust of, the, of our flesh. That's simply the desires of the flesh. It could be uh, illicit sexual connotation or it could simply be the lust for power, the lust for money. There are some people in the state of Tennessee whose goal in life is to find out how many people they can tell what to do. Some of them run for the county commission, others run for city council, some of them are in the state legislature in Nashville. Lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. Now watch this. It's a fallen nature they got from Adam, the children of wrath. Notice they're not called sons of God. They're not. They're children of wrath, even as others. I, I get really get offended now. I get offended when a bunch of people who don't know Southerners and don't know Bible believers and have never read a Bible criticize, well, those Bible thumpers down there in the South, they're mean people. You better watch out for them. They're mean people. Man, you're talking about the people I spend my whole life with. I preach to those Bible thumpers in the South every week of my life. And they're some of the best people I know. I'm going to tell you who's mean. It's not the people I preach to. The people who are mean are the people at those news desks in New York. 
and the people in the bureaucracy in Washington that would take your property away from you if they could. They're lost. The Bible calls them children of wrath. I'm not a child of wrath anymore. I've been saved. I'm a son of God now. The children of wrath, even as others. But God, and that's the only way there'll be an interruption. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. When did he love us? Even when we were dead in sins. That's where I was. I was born dead. But I've been saved from the guttermost to the uttermost. I was dead in sins, but when I was dead in sins, the grace of God quickened us together with Christ by grace. Ye are saved. And when God saved us, he took us out of that graveyard where we were dead in trespasses and in sins and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Did you know that you as a born again believer are already seated in heaven? God has already seen you there because you are in his son and his son and our savior seated on the father's right hand and if I'm in Christ and Christ is in me and Christ is on the father's right hand, I'm there with Christ now. So I've been saved from the guttermost. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right, let me give you these other three. Look over with me, please, at verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ. Oh, what a miserable condition that is. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant's promise, God made no covenants or promises to the Gentiles. He made all of them to the Jews. We were on the outside, fellas. Having no hope. There wasn't a thing in the world I could do about it in the energy of the flesh. And without God in the world. Can you imagine being without God now? Hey, some of us have been saved so long, it's hard for us to remember what it was like to be lost. Some of these young people, my children were saved as children. My wife was saved at nine years old. Jack Green, Oliver Green's brother, was preaching revival the night my wife got saved. And some of these young people have been saved since they were five or six. They have no recollection of life without God. We are without God in the world. Here's the eighth birthright, verse 13. But now, in Christ, that's where we are now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh. How do you like that? made nigh by the blood of Christ. I'm not on the outside looking in. I'm on the inside. Then look at the ninth birthright, down in verse number 17. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For, here it is now, for through him we both, that's Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit under the Father. Every born again believer, now listen to me, everybody listen to me. Every one of you that are saved have access to God right now. You have access right now. And our access is through Christ. Now if I didn't believe that, what would be the purpose of praying? Why should you pray if you can't get through? And you can get through. I've heard preachers say, bless God, if you're not right with God, God won't hear and answer your prayer. How am I supposed to get right with God if God won't hear me when I'm not right with God? If I have a fuss with my wife and I love my wife, I've never raised my voice to my wife. She's never raised her voice to me. But I'm not a fool either. Y'all aren't. You don't put two people in the same house and them not get ill at each other. Well, if I get cross with my wife and she gets cross with me, how in the world am I ever going to get right with her if she won't hear me when I want to make up? If I said, babe, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have acted like that. She said, 
We're not in fellowship. I'm not listening to you. Well, how would you women feel if my wife came to me and said, babe, I'm sorry, I shouldn't act like I did. I said, we're not in fellowship. I'm not listening to you. You say, you hard-headed man. God doesn't treat his children that way. You can get a prayer through every time you get on your knees. Now, God may not give you everything you ask for. My daddy didn't give me everything I asked for, and now I'm glad he didn't. And God hadn't given me everything I've asked him for. And I'm now glad he didn't. But he heard everything I asked for. We have access. Every child of God has access. You can pray. So you want to pray. Because you can get your prayers through. I prayed today. I prayed yesterday. Prayed the day before. If I live till tomorrow, I'm going to pray again. I've got people that are lost that I'm praying for to be saved. And I'm confident God has heard me ask for their salvation. We have access. That's the ninth birthright. Look at the tenth one. Verse number 22. In whom ye also are builded together. Every born again believer is joined together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Christ lives in me just like he lives in you. We have the same Heavenly Father. We are joined together. We are a body and a building. We are brethren. We're joined together. You can have greater fellowship with the body of Christ than any other group on earth. I have better fellowship with you all than I do so in my own kin. You know, wonderful thing about born again believers is we don't have to break any ice. When I got here Sunday morning, I didn't need an introduction. Y'all are my brethren. It's just like I was here a few days ago. Just pick up where we left off. Because we're joined together in Christ. Now that's 10 birthrights. Now I'm going to have to skip chapter 3, but if the rapture doesn't take place, and we live the next year by the grace of God, I'll preach from chapter 3. It's marvelous. It deals with the church as, as Christ's body called the mystery. And I'm anxious to preach to you about that. i got to skip that. Go to, go to my text. Chapter 4, verse 1. Based on these ten birthrights, Paul says, I therefore, because we're joined together, because we have access to God, because we're seated in heavenly places, because we have all blessings in heavenly places, because we are justified in his grace, we have all blessings. We were chosen in him from the foundation of the world. We're sealed to the day of redemption. And every born again believer has that same birthright. Therefore, Paul says, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul saying, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Now that word beseech means to ask. Paul is not threatening here. Paul didn't say, I D-double dog dare you. He says, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Live up to your birthright. Now, it's interesting to me that people that know a lot about their family genealogy, their family tree, have a greater respect for their family and for why they are what they are. I, I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't golf, I don't take vacations. I'm not against that. I just don't do it. My, my son is a hunter's hunter. If it's in season, he hunts it. If hunting season's over with, he fishes. And he does tremendous taxidermy work. He entered a, a buck he mounted that was shot up here in Russell County, Virginia, in the South Carolina State Taxidermy Competition in the professional division. My son's 21 years old. 
he finished second. And he finished second to a full-bodied bobcat a man had mounted. Whole bobcat jumping up. That's what he lost to. And his was just a shoulder mount, eight-point buck from Virginia. I don't do any of that. I'm not against it. I just, I don't have any interest in that. But I'm very interested in mechanical things. I like grease under my fingernails. I've always had hot rods. I'd restored my first car when I was in high school, a 64 Ford Galaxy, fastback. Rebuilt the engine, fender skirts, did the interior, canary yellow. I sold it so I could get married. I needed a little walking around money. I got the better end of the deal. I'd rather have mama than have that car. But I did see one a couple weeks ago in the junkyard going to preach, and I stopped and took pictures of it. That, I enjoy that. I, I, I have a, always had a fascination with mechanical things. But my great granddaddy was a mechanic. My granddad, Harold Seitler's daddy, Horace Seitler, was moved by Packard Motor Car Company. Y'all remember what a Packard automobile is. Was moved by Packard Motor Car Company from the dealership in Columbia, South Carolina, to Greenville, South Carolina. That's how Harold Seitler got to Greenville to later start Tabernacle Baptist Church. Was Packard Motor Car Company. So I think I got that honest. And I think about my granddaddy all along. My great granddaddy. I remember him. I was a little boy when he died. I have some of his mechanic manuals that were issued by Packard Motor Car Company and sent to the dealerships. And I have some of those manuals, shop manuals, in my possession. They were my great granddaddies. And I think about that all along because that was my forebear. That was my heritage. That's all Paul is asking us to do. Walk worthy of these birthrights, just live up to them. And if you and I will strive to do that, nobody will have to chide us on our manner of life or our conduct. Man, I'm already seated in heavenly places. When we get to church, we sing about heaven and talk about heaven. The preacher preaches about heaven. And every now and then we have a little heaven on earth. But I'm already seated there. So I'm going to go gather with some other people that are going the same place I'm going. Walk worthy of the vocation or with your call. We'll spend the rest of our life trying to do that. But may God help us. And may God add his blessing to this reading of the word this week. Let's stand together, please. Our Father, we thank thee now for the Lord Jesus Christ. who gave himself for our trespasses, died to put our sin away. And I pray, Father, that you would do a work in our hearts in the light of these great things you've done for us, these ten birthrights. I pray thee, Father, help us to walk worthy of these birthrights. And, Father, when we fail, Help us to find a place to pray, a place to repent and confess our failure and our lack. And help us to get up and dust ourselves off and continue moving on. Please, Lord, give us grace to walk worthy of these great things. And while the heads are bowed or eyes are closed, if you're not saved tonight, you can be saved. And I urge upon you the importance of being born again. If you are saved, but you'd like to come pray, you have some need, some burden on your heart, I invite you to come. Whatever your need might be, I invite you to come. We're going to have a stanza of an invitation. I want my brother to sing the invitation, and the pastor will be here at the front. If you need to come and have a word of prayer about whatever the need might be, we invite you to come. Come on now, if you need to come pray, come on. Just as I am without one plea, but that I was shed for me, to come pray. and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lord.
thanksgiving. Oh God. The Lord for saving your soul. For making you an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Just I invite you to come. You need to come. Whatever you need might be. Thank you for being here. Let me encourage our teachers to contact your absentees. Be on visitation. Have a time to go visit our church-wide visitation Saturday and our bus ministry. We encourage you to invite people to come. And thank you, Brother Carper, for that wonderful message and all the messages. If the Lord doesn't come, we hope to have you back next year. If you'd like to have him back next year, say amen. 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 And as the preacher says, a woman too. Amen. <laughs> it's just been real good. And again, I want to thank the ladies for preparing the food. My, my, it was just wonderful. Had a wonderful fellowship yesterday and the preachers, I was expecting about 60 preachers, and we had about half that many. But uh, we had plenty of food. Instead of going around one time, we got to go around three times, and so we had plenty, plenty of food. Thank you for being here. Let's be on our best. Like he said, walk worthy of your vocation. You're somebody. Practice it. Live up to it. Amen. Shake hands with five people or more. Good night and God bless you. Thank you.